Okay, cool. Um, I'm sure more people will be trickling in as, as we go through, but um, just wanted to get going really. So the format of the session is going to be very conversational. Um, I'll kind of facilitate, I'll throw some questions out there. In terms of people actually in attendance, um, there's a Q&A at the bottom or there's a chat where throughout the session you can throw questions in there. Um, for the panel, I'll, I'll feed them back as we go so they can come straight and answer it and I'll, um, I'll do the speaking. Um, but just worth, I think, introducing who's on the panel today um, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So um, first up, just from um, clean side, Hi, my name's um, Greg Freeman. I'm in charge of the revenue team at Clean. I tend to facilitate on these types of um, sessions because there are people with far greater expertise than me in the analytics world. I uh, just don't mind talking a bit. So uh, that's who I am. Um, we've got Matt Sawyer, also from Clean, one of the founders of Clean.ai, um, formerly Chief Data Officer at Trainline.com, um, one of the earliest analysts at Justy, and obviously saw them all through their IPO journey. Um, we've got James Cotton, um, Director of Analytics for World Remit, formerly of Hotels.com. Um, and we've got Nermin, oh, we had Nermin yep. Rina, who has now gone. Um, <laughs> obviously uh, panicked by her, by, by her introduction. Um, so when Nermin <laughs> back, um, she's Head of Marketing Analytics for World Remit, um, a business that we'll find lots more about, um, out about in the, next, um, in the next hour or so. Um, started off her career with the British Red Cross in the third sector and has obviously trans transferred that knowledge into the private sector now. So um, that's that's who we're joined to um, joined by today. Um, as I said, uh, we'll just wait for Nermin to dial back in um, and we'll uh, start start with the, the first question. And like I said, really encourage everybody who's in the audience to put their questions out there and um, and ask what ask whatever is of interest with to them in the analytics marketing analytics space um, and hopefully the the team here can can really answer those questions to the best of their uh, best of their ability so we'll uh, give Nerman another 30 seconds to get back in and otherwise um, yeah the disappearing Nerman James I will be throwing the first question out to you I guess is uh, is probably how this will go if Nerman doesn't uh, doesn't dial back in no, that's fine. How about we just get started and uh, number one, yeah, we'll back yeah. in once she's here. Cool. Okay, so um, always a good place to start is is ultimately the foundations, and from that first call, um, we've had World Remit as a business has an interesting story, um, but also in the way that the analytics department has grown as the business has scaled is is really interesting. So I'd love to learn um, a little bit more about kind of the bigger World Remit story, why the business was founded. Um, what the problem is it's looking to solve, and then why analytics has scaled alongside it to where it is now. I think that that would be really interesting for the audience. Cool, sure, yeah, um, I can take that one. Oh, good, we've got Norma back now. Um, the World Remit is a super interesting uh, business because it's um, it plays in the, North, well, it was founded uh, by a uh, very passionate founder um, from Somaliland, uh, and he... Uh, started the business in order to help uh, attack a very real customer problem, um, which is how it is that we can send money back to different home countries. Um, and so the company really grew out of that initial uh, momentum. So originally it was uh, founded on some uh, key corridors in, order, in terms of digital remittances and then has really uh, grown a lot since then. Um, when the uh, company was first founded, it was a really innovative product. And then since then, there's been a lot of like new competitors in this space. Um, ones that you know would be more familiar probably to um, people moving money back and forth between Europe and the UK and stuff like that. But World Remit is really a leader in terms of uh, north south uh, and digitalized uh, remittances. Okay, brilliant. And in terms of like as as you said, really passionate founder. Um, generally, we find that the more passionate the founder, the more um, kind of emotion driven the growth is and kind of like solving that problem. So at what point, um, and this is obviously to either of you, at what, at what point would you say in that growth journey, analytics became the priority and, and started to be the, the way that the business was shaped in terms of its growth? Uh, I think that's probably been the way for quite a while. So the company was originally founded in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, and back then, as I mentioned, it was a super novel product, you know, the ability to send money online uh, and removing a lot of the friction that you would normally have. Um, 
And, but I think we're lucky in the fact that because it's a digital first business, it's an internet business, uh, data has always been very core to how it is that we do things. Um, Norman and I have both been here for about a year ourselves now. Um, and it's not like we were walking into like, you know, a, an empty space. Actually, there's a, a long history of analytics, uh, various different approaches, uh, really using data to do data driven decisions, you know, all of that kind of thing. And so really, uh, what the current investments that we're making in this space, are really about trying to accelerate that because the company itself is very fast growing. Um, and actually probably one of our biggest challenges is, is that the demand for analytics and data really outstrips our ability to supply it. Um, and so we, we're lucky in that we haven't had to really, you know, um, you know, fight for that, I guess, from the beginning. Um, and also the fact that there was really good foundations for us to be able to build on and then continuing to add and invest in the team, as you mentioned, in order to really scale data and insight alongside how it is that we scale the business. Okay, interesting. So, like, as as uh, as we see businesses scale, um, what would you say? And Nerman, this 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 could be over to you for for a bit of feedback. Um, what would you say are the challenges that you guys have come across while scaling that business? And a lot of people on the call will be will be scaling their own analytics orgs at the moment and um, whether it's marketing or marketing analytics or just the wider analytics org. what what are some of the challenges you've faced and more importantly how, how have you overcome them and how how can you help the people listening overcome their own problems when they get to that stage yeah thanks greg um sorry that i disappeared my internet does that more often than not i should change it um right. <laughs> james is laughing because i've done that to him about five times every time we have a one-to-one -one. um <laughs> In terms of analytics challenges, I think a lot of people have the same thing, and especially joining in January or joining any other business, it's one of those is that each business function defines things in their own way. It's not a right or wrong, it's just different. And then over time, you work really hard to, um, to standardize it. And I think that's one of the challenges I think everybody faces, which is having one standard KPI and Matt's nodding because he's probably like, yeah, this is why, you know, clean is here. Um, <laughs> and it's that idea. And I think that's one of the things, once you standardize everything or as well as you can, um, then what happens is everyone's working off the same check sheet. The conversations are the same. You know, you're following, you're going in the right direction together and there's less misunderstandings. I guess that's one of the things. The, t the second is, and it's my favorite thing that I, I've, I've had multiple meltdowns about in the past, not just at World Remit, is different sources of data and different formats of that information, which has driven me nuts endlessly trying to put together. And that's not really a bad thing. I quite enjoy it. Otherwise, I wouldn't How many different ways can you format a date? <laughs> Sorry? How many different ways can you format a date, Norman? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just that. That's too, once you resolve, once you standardize your KPIs and you standardize your data, everything else is smooth. That's 90% of your problem right there. Okay. I don't know, do you want to take a third, James? I was going to say, I think the other challenge, probably more from my perspective, is that the app, as I mentioned before, the appetite for data analytics, data science, all that kind of stuff, our world dream is extremely large. Um, and you can imagine that we have a lot of data in terms of marketing data, but also performance and uh, product data and all of those kinds of things. Um, and so for us, there's also a big challenge around prioritization, making sure that we're working on the highest impact projects first, and that we're trying to move as many forward as we can while at the same time doing the, the right level of analysis on things. Okay. Um, and going back to the, the different definitions of data, what, what kind of active steps have you taken with the business users in particular to try and kind of what 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 does that process look like making sure that everybody does have that level of understanding who's involved in that who's who's led it from a commercial arm versus the analytics arm what what, what does that process look like i was going to say exactly the same thing I, um there's a couple of different ways i think that we can approach that we have approached it one is that obviously by bringing the team together into one team which we did when i i joined uh it enables a lot more and efficient communication across all the different analysts. Um, it also means that we have the opportunity as a cross-functional team in order to bring together a bunch of the stakeholders from across the business so that they, you know, we can sit down and agree on what a definition is going to be going forward. Does it need to be the same definition for all, you know, the future? No. But at least we can agree at a certain point in time and then start to put things forward. 
And then I think particularly from the analytics standpoint, uh, one of the key things that is that because we actually control how it is that that data gets surfaced often to most of our stakeholders, we have the ability then to start to standardize and streamline and, you know, kind of bring all of that together so that we have just one view of the world. Okay, nice. And Matt, just thinking about your background, the view, like that was obviously the, um, the kind of human element of that. Have you got any thoughts on best practices for doing that from a technical perspective and, and making sure that everyone's aligned? I suppose it's that data dictionary piece really is probably the, the, the thing there. <coughs> yeah, so um, there's, there's the, it's that classic triangle, right, of, of technology, people and process and, and uh, yeah, uniting that in, in, in the, and constructing that in the right way. But we're talking about building a single source of truth. Uh, one, one way or another is, is ultimately what I think lies at the heart of any kind of good data and analytic strategy. Uh, you want, and we've talked about it, uh, you want everybody singing from the same hymn sheet. You don't want those disagreements. You don't want meetings which are just wasted with fighting over how to calculate revenue. Uh, yeah, that's it's, it's a waste of everybody's time. So I think um, really the the it, it's it's naturally an organic process, exactly as James says. It doesn't have to be set in stone forever, but you have to capture and document what it is that you're doing um, and building up that metadata about the the, the, the data landscape is really critically important. Um, it, yeah, it, documenting that and making that document a, uh, a a key part a key component of that data journey uh, is 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 critical and really hard to do because the moment you've written it is out of date pretty much so staying on top of that that's really where the process comes in and that's really where uh, equipping people with the tooling to uh, so the technology to uh, make that process as uh, seamless and painless as possible uh, encourages encourages that best practice Okay. Without um, without obviously plugging, like what 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 ways have you seen that solved previously that some of the people on the call might not have thought of to solve it so far? So whether it's everything from a Google sheet to uh, like what 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 good ways have you seen of doing that? Specifically, the metadata thing. I think I think you, all sorts of different solutions, right? Any kind of shared document um, platform. So Confluence is a, is a really common one. Um, but the problem with those things that, uh, is that they aren't, they're not a sort of necessary part of delivery of a, of a data manipulation job. So they inevitably fall by the wayside. Everybody's busy, everybody's got stuff to do. So <clears throat> I think the closer you can tie that to the data itself, to the data uh, warehouse and the, the, the output, that single source of truth, the more likely you are to stay uh, up to date with it. So I think the best way to do it is actually make it part of that data warehouse. Have queryable metadata in your database. Um, that really puts it front and center and, uh, and it's gonna encourage that, encourage that best practice. Okay, awesome. Um, so James Nerman, you mentioned that you, you are just about getting there in terms of you sat the people down, you've, you've kind of overcome those, those first set of challenges there. Um, what I'm really interested to understand with a business that's scaled in the way that yours has, um, once you've got that information into a good place and you've got the team built out, um, what types of interventions are you guys delivering um, specifically to drive additional value and answer questions? And also, yeah, just to drive that value back to the business to make data analytically useful. So I don't know whether James or Nerman, you want to go first on that, but yeah, really interested to understand the interventions you've implemented and, and way, ones that people could pick up and run with if they were to do the same. Sure. I mean, uh, how I think about analytics, and we're mostly talking about marketing analytics here, but within uh, our team is also uh, our central insights team, teams that support other stakeholders across the business, as well as our data science team. Um, which is a little bit more focused rather than on insights and recommendations, uh, strategic decision support, and more focused on data product building. Um, but in general, I think that the role of analytics is, you know, to manage sort of a cycle with a group of stakeholders. Um, if I think about, how, uh, you know, what, I, what my expectations are for most of the analysts that are on the team, it's to use the data that we have in order to do two things. One is to be able to help our stakeholders understand what's happening, um, so manage that sort of insight action recommendation cycle uh, and continuously try and improve on it. So it doesn't really matter, you know, exactly what the specific use case is, exactly what the specific, uh, you know, thing that we're trying to solve at that 
particular point in time. That's the, the specific data set that we have. It's always about managing that sort of cycle around, you know, what is the insight? What is the action that I can make off the back of it? Does it work? And, you know, what are we going to work on next? And sort of a continuous cycle like that. Um, I do think there's also a component in there about challenge, which is, you know, one of the, the good parts about that world remit is that by having a central analytics function, it means that, uh, you know, we're able to be an effective challenge on the business as well, how we think we should do things better, how we think we should think about things in a different way. Um, and so I think, you know, as we, we continue to build out our analytics platform, it's really about trying to do, you know, manage that cycle in a kind of continuous manner and really trying not to repeat some of the stuff that we've done before. Um, so there's a lot of focus on scalable things. Um, I will talk a little bit about World Dreamer, but in previous iterations, we've done things like, you know, trying to identify ways of um, estimating the value of customers uh, so that we can then, you know, try and choose the appropriate amounts to bid on those customers or identifying segments uh, uh, that we should target in different ways, you know, either through bespoke, you know, communications via CRM or things like that. I mean, what about you? <laughs> Woo, James. Um... So there are a number of things, right, that you can do. And, you know, when we say interventions, we're actually talking about creating stuff that supports the business, make better decisions, right? It's not like there's a problem and analytics is the solution. It's more like what role does analytics play in terms of growing the business, in terms of growing our understanding? So some of the things we've done, and it's actually been really interesting because World Remit allows you to have the space to grow and direct them and direct people and say, you know, have open and honest discussions that say, today we know this, tomorrow we want to know a few other things. So an example is that we, you know, the, everything you read out there is about, you need to understand your data sources, you need to understand your attribution, you need to understand this, that, and the other. We kind of took a different stand and we said, right, we want to understand incrementality. We want to understand when you put all of everything together, what does the extra whatever get you? And that's the focus we're doing now. And, you know, and that's what's interesting is that World Dreamer allowed us to have these conversations, you know, every single stakeholder, whether it's finance, whether it's the CMO, they were like, this is what we need to learn. And then analytics were given the openness and you don't, you don't always get that. We're given the free range to say, okay, we will follow what you think is right. And I think that's really important is to have that opportunity to build something that you really believe in and then take it forward and then that, becomes an intervention of sorts. Okay. Yeah, because one of the things which is very interesting about the business model of World Remit is that there's a lot of natural complexity which comes from the breadth of the network that we operate. Um, so aside from maybe, you know, the largest incumbent players, we probably have the one of the largest uh, networks in terms of send countries, different ways of paying in, and receive countries in different ways of paying out. You know, if you want to receive a bank transfer or pick up cash, uh, or you can, you know, even send direct to, to mobile wallets, things like M-Pesa, which many of you all have heard of in Kenya. Um, and so there's a lot of like natural complexity, even if you think about the business from that perspective. Um, and so, you know, there are interventions that we need to build in terms of trying to uh, solve for all of those simultaneously in terms of, you know, complicated decision making that obviously can't be done by a person, but also ones where we're actually trying to distill down all of the complicated data, like Norman's talking about, to understand the incrementality of, for example, the marketing program or chunks of uh, it was in there. Uh, which enable us to make more strategic decisions and change how it is that we want to go about marketing, for example. Okay. Um, something that I, I'm finding really interesting, just in because you you brought up a, a couple of times, James, is this move to a centralized function versus a localized function. I think we'll find that people on the call, um, and probably even including Matt's experience historically, like probably have done it one way or both ways. Um, what have you found to be the pros and cons of moving to a centralized function and, and what was that main that, that first trigger for doing it? I think that's that's really actionable in essence for, for people listening. Uh, I think I, if you think about how you can organize uh, an analytics team, there's you know you can either go central or diffuse. you can also do things like being aligned to stakeholders or being more aligned to function or some, like, uh, something like that. Um, in my experience of working with analytics teams, um, I find that a centralized team is, the, there's a couple pros there. Um, one is that by bringing everybody together, uh, we're able to work as a team a lot more effectively, which is just, you know, normal human nature in terms of, you know, you, you, you talk to your teammates, you understand what they're working on, and you can build and learn off of each other. Um, whereas when you're scattered in all, so, you know, if they're in my team and they're forced to work with the stakeholders, they're gonna talk to everybody. Um, but if they're in the different teams, then, you know, they don't have that natural incentive to, to interact as much. Yeah. 
Um, I also think that by bringing together analytics and data science professionals into one team, we're able to offer a much better career path um, because it's a lot harder for people to develop and try new things when they're uh, embedded in all the different teams. But when we have people together into one team, then you know it's a lot easier to develop a clear career path um, for how people would you know develop and move forward in uh, an analytics team. Uh, I think the cons are the same kind of ones that you would think of, which is that uh, if they're concentrated in our team, it's very easy for them to be inward focused um, and not necessarily, um, you know, getting out there and trying to work closely with their stakeholders to talk, you know, manage the, the insight cycles that I was talking about before. That's one of the reasons why we've chosen, um, or I choose to always make sure that the team is as aligned as possible for the organizational structure. So you have clear defined stakeholders, the analytics analyst uh, relationship. So people know who they're working with, they can get to learn the business, they can, you know, learn more about the area, and they can help and build those relationships and try and drive that area forward. But at the same time, they're also part of the, the wider analytics community, and so they can learn off of each other and, you know, progress technically, that kind of thing. Okay, awesome. So um, I'm going to assume um, this has been a move that's happened since you guys came in. Did you did you drive and lead that, that shift towards centralization? Yeah. It was, uh, I think it was just part of how it is that I was hired in particular. Um, okay. Um, so, Norman, you've seen this firsthand then in terms of like being at the coalface of helping James implement this. What, if, if the guys listening are thinking, all oh, that makes sense, like I love that career path point um, in particular, like what, what are the, the foundations that you need to put in place to bring everything back central from a more kind of localized, um, localized team? So I, so I have a very unique way of operating and James is smiling because my take on things is that you could prep for them as much as possible, but it's still going to be a challenge when you actually implement it. So sometimes it's good to just, just say this is what's going to happen and then everyone just rallies towards it. And that's the beauty of being a team is that irrespective of what direction you're going in, whether you're sitting in isolation, whether you're sitting as a big team, ultimate goal is that we want our business to succeed. So if that business, if we want it to succeed, it doesn't matter whether we sit in isolation or someone says to us, you're one team. If anything, there's a beauty in being one team because I can then cry to 10 other people when I'm having a hard day instead of just two other people. Yeah. You know, I, in the past, I've worked where I was the only analyst. And it was hard because not, not as dramatic as cry to people, but sometimes you just want to bounce ideas off. You want to say, this is what I'm thinking. I'm, I haven't fully thought it through. What do you think? How can I do this better? And all of that comes in when there's a centralized function. With regards to how it was when James, um, came, actually, I started a week before James. I just want to point that out. <laughs> no, I mean, whole thing. Um, how was that week? <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> Like, honestly, because James hadn't started and I was like, so who's managing me? And they're like, just do you. And that's the great thing about World Dreamer is that you can take any kind of leadership, any kind of charge and make it your own. Obviously, within reason, ultimately, you want to work towards a business goal. But that's the whole point. The whole point is as long as you're doing the right thing, no one's really going to tell you off. And you have the opportunity to but well, irrespective of all of that, I think James, and I'm gonna do, I'm only gonna compliment him once and that's his Christmas present. I think he has done something brilliant, which is he brings a personality that rallies people. So when James says, let's do this, and it'll always be because we need to get here and we're gonna get here like this, you kind of buy into that idea rather than him just telling you what to do. That's that's really interesting because we've we've got um we always find on these webinars we get a mix of um, senior leaders and analysts and engineer type backgrounds. So there's almost that either end of the spectrum thing. So now having having worked in that team, Norman, would you say if I'm a senior um, if I'm if I'm a senior stakeholder or if I'm an analyst who's looking to move their way up, that kind of compelling personality is it is as important in a technical role as it is in any other role in the business kind of thing because you think of a sales leader and be like oh that person's got to be really compelling and like that's whereas i think that goes a little bit on the wayside based on people's technical skills but it sounds like you found that actually um that kind of true leader personality works as well and is as important in um, in in analytics as it is anywhere else is that is that a fair observation i'm listening norman <laughs> My end of the year review is ending, guys. <laughs> Don't ruin it for me. 
No, um, do you know what it is? It's at the end of the day, analytics is hard. Telling the business that if something is going wrong or if there are challenges or if change needs to happen is hard work. And I think analysts or any function of the business will see that on a day to day. So I think when you have a personality that makes things very clear, makes things very organized and you know, disseminates information after hours of analytics that says, okay, these are the top three points that are really important. Um, and this is what we're gonna do off them. That is way more useful. Um, actually, it's not way more useful. It's one of the things that are useful because, you know, over time I have, and I can admit this, you know, I have a problem where I get stuck in the weeds. Yeah. And I get stuck in the weeds so often, I'll have a panic attack and I'll be like, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I'm not an analyst. Maybe I shouldn't be a manager. And, you know, you always need someone who's going to be like, actually doing the right thing. This is what it means. This is how you need to communicate it. And it's development for everybody. So, yes, Greg, to your question is, I think as well as the technical skills, you need to be able to have a way of communicating with your stakeholders. It doesn't, it's not all about charisma. It's just if you can get the, if you land the information in the right way, that's what matters. Okay. Awesome. James, did you like it? Charisma. I'm still stuck on the fact that she called me organized. <laughs> when uh, it comes to analytics. <laughs> um, okay, so something else that very often comes up on these sessions is all like, and just this is just a good, in, like, good inter interjection to remind you all to ask questions. Like, feel free to throw questions about your own challenges. Like, I know we've got senior stakeholders on, we've got analysts on. Some of you are in your first job, your second job. Like, ask ask the questions that that matter to you because that's obviously the journey that all three of the panelists have been on. Um, but something that always comes up, and um, James, I imagine it will have happened um, slightly before you to justify you as a hire, but also I know you've been growing the team quite rapidly since. And Matt, you've been through this a number of times. What is the best way to, first of all, justify analytics as a function and, and garner that initial investment? but more importantly, have kind of proof of valued it out as a department so you can really ramp that up and, and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hire five more people this quarter because analysis is now as important as anything else in our business. Start with James and then James, obviously you can hand that over to Matt when you're done. But yeah, well, what, what does that look like? How do you go about that? Yeah, that's right. I think as I was mentioning earlier, I think at World Dream and actually at previous companies that I've worked at like Hotels.com, which is part of Expedia, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention their names, um, but uh, at previous companies that I've worked at and at World Dream, you know, data and analytics and data science are core to how it is that the business runs. And that's, I think, really a, an attribute of being a tech company um, and being fast growing and, you know, being digital first and all of that kind of stuff. And if I think about the leadership team and the, the people that we have the pleasure of working with at uh, World Dream all the time, you know, they're used to having a level of understanding and data and support. Um, and so that initial conversation just is not one that we have to have. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, a super open environment like that. Um, in terms of then making further investments in the team, because actually uh, we're in the process right now of making uh, a pretty big investment in the team. Um, I think we're going to probably end up growing the team by about eight or nine people um, from a base of 11. So almost doubling it. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons why it is that we've been able to show that. One is that, uh, you know, from the very beginning, my expectation for all of the analysts, it's all about impact. It's not about volume of queries run or, you know, complexity of reports or, you know, most interesting color scheme um, used in a dashboard. But instead it's about, you know, what is the impact that you're gonna have on the business? Um, are you having that impact? Uh, are you working effectively with your stakeholders in order to, to drive the impact? Um, which means that, you know, we have, you know, dozens and dozens of case studies in terms of how it is that by better understanding how it is that, you know, our actions or potential actions are having an impact on the business that we can just kind of do that and keep growing. Uh, the other thing is that from my personal perspective, and if I think about how it is that, you know, World Dream needs to grow, it's that we need to be able to um, grow the company faster than we have to grow the individual cost lines, which allows us to do things like lower prices and return value to our customers. And so that means that, you know, we're not just trying to, uh, you know, hire lots of people. Um, really what we try to do is make sure that we rely on automation, uh, a lot of automation of insights and reports and all of that kind of stuff so that we can, you know, keep the team working on interesting projects, like keep them motivated and engaged, but also means that we don't need to scale people as fast as we have to scale the business. Um, and so it's kind of a, a mix of both, if that makes sense, in terms of we know the value of an analyst, we know the, what they can do, 
And then we also do our best to make sure that we try and use technology or automation and that kind of thing in order to scale that way first. And do you, do you ever have to so specifically ROI a hire or is it the business just understands that that like there is there is added value by growing the analytics function? Uh, I think it just kind of depends. Um, to be honest, like if I think about some of the projects that we worked on this year, like, uh, you know, the, the ROA is kind of high enough and the company's growing fast enough that, you know, we can make the numbers uh, directionally work, even if we haven't gone through it and, you know, like added up every project, if that makes sense. Okay, that's, that's cool. And Matt, I know like one of your big things is um, like how to effectively genuinely communicate this at the top table and make sure that people care in essence. Because uh, uh, unfortunately, like business is still run by people who have, been around the business world from before in a lot of cases before data was a prevalent element and making it easy was prevalent so how how would you suggest if there's anybody on the call who's thinking i really want to get my senior team bought into this we need to invest who who are you going to go to first what are you going to sit down and ask them to do and, and what's the conversation going to look like yeah it's a really interesting question so i think uh, statute of limitations on this this story is definitely up. So, uh, if I go all the way back to to Just Eat days, um, just before their Series C, they were operating in a, a space that was just deeply uncompetitive. They had free reign of the of the UK market. Um, they were number one in in uh, twelve of their thirteen markets. <clears throat> so, pushback I would get on investment in data was was genuine and, and heartfelt and it was we're absolutely killing it everything's up and to the right why do we need to you know make this investment um how are we going to see that roi and i really had to use all sorts of um sort of tricks and and uh, uh, uh maneuverings and uh, persuasion to uh help to land the argument that what if all the decisions that were being made, if you're not measuring those decisions, what if they're actually sort of hindering that growth, repressing that growth, um, it, it, as, a, as a worst case scenario and, and you know, best case not adding to it. Um, so I think I think it's about finding the 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 uh, finding the pain. Um, it's it's like anything, and I think Greg, you can probably speak pretty, pretty articulately to this because ultimately it's sales. Right. You 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 need to ask the question and ask the question and ask the question and get to the get to the root of the the, the pain point or the blocker or whatever it is with that particular stakeholder. Uh, figure out what that is and then think think about how you can uh, apply measurement data analytics to that uh, for something that is really going to resonate for them. And then they will they will turn very quickly from a blocker to a champion if if the perception is that you can solve some of that pain. Um, and you can with data almost always um, then you you will have a champion on your hands if you can communicate that well so it really is uh, it really is about that empathy and about that um, that sort of uh, initial inquisition to get to a thing that you can really uh, hang your hat on in terms of uh, in terms of something to apply data to okay cool yeah I mean um, just in purely from a sales perspective because nobody in analytics gets trained on sales be my guess um the question tell me more can be just really powerful let people speak they'll give you their surface pain um ah uh, ingest it and just say tell me a little bit more about that and that's what gets you so that can be really positive for first um senior stakeholders as well um so there's a couple of awesome questions coming in now so um one from James, one from Renuka. We'll get to those, but just remember everybody else, like, like let's get asking those questions because we're going to have 15, 20 minutes in the end um, to, to really dive into those questions that you guys were asking because that's ultimately what's important. Um, I'm So this this is something that I know like I, I kind of pushed us to focus on a little bit, but um, I think when people are coming into these sessions, they're looking for actionable stuff to take away. And um, we're, we're talking marketing and pricing analytics with you guys. But what, what should we be tracking in terms of KPIs to prove the value of data? What, what's important? What, what have you always found to be the most important metrics and KPIs for the business in terms of getting them to really understand it and obviously where it hits the bottom line and why people buy into it? I'd be really interested, Nermin, to kind of to hear your thoughts on, on that and um, what KPIs are a priority for you guys at the moment. Yeah, um, I am definitely of the thinking that less is more. Okay. Um, 
And James is smiling because there have been times where I've like got off and ran with something and then he's like, that's not answering anything. And that's a, that's a really important point is that you're like, why are you laughing? <laughs> I think you're uh, being too harsh on yourself, Herman. I know, I know. I'm trying to be humble, but I think it's coming across as insecure. Let me rein that back. <laughs> No, you know what it is? It's really, really simple. And in my head, it's really simple. Less is more. You could, you know, spend, your, as an analyst, you could spend all your time digging and digging and digging and digging. And every time you'll find something new and before you know it, the world's moved on and you're still trying to answer that one question. So the most important thing in my head is that your KPI should be based on what you're trying to achieve. There's obviously going to be standard KPIs across the business that you need to do. You know, if you're a... Um, e-commerce business you want to know how many repeat sales are happening you want to know what your revenue is you want to know what your profitability is and all of those things and that's great but then you get to a level of information where you're trying new things and then one size doesn't fit all so you you know the things to track is to ask yourself what is it i'm trying to learn and then work backwards from there rather than saying i have all of these kpis can it answer this information but other things are you know and I found this at multiple companies where people never really understood it properly or, you know, there just wasn't enough resource to kind of really push for it. And that's things like churn and ROI, which is sometimes when you're a fast growing business, and I've seen this before, you don't really realize the people you're losing because the people that you're adding in is far greater. But, you know, I think churn's really important. And especially when we're going to move towards a world where we're going to have less granular data, where we're going to be able to track people less, that engagement with the brand becomes first and foremost thing that drives your word of mouth, for example. So, oh, I waffled a bit. But what, the point I'm trying to make is there are going to be standard KPIs that your business needs to know, i.e., are we making money? Do we have people using us? Do we know, you know, what our churn is? But then everything else should be based on what you're trying to learn, not what you already have. Uh, I think that that's, that's such a good point. Like the the world of, of VC backed businesses now tend to talk in like net revenue churn. And obviously net revenue churn is important because it reflects growth as well as loss, but actually net revenue churn is just better if you're identifying that you're churning and you're, you're not churning anymore. So I think, yeah, like not, not only focusing on the positives, also focusing on the, the challenges and the negatives and, and trying to intervene there is, is yeah, really, really powerful. Um, okay, yeah, fantastic. So um, you've you've led us there, Norman, on to a topic that I know you're passionate about. And this this came out of that first conversation that we had about about kind of sitting down and, and doing this, uh, having this conversation. Which was I screaming even... at you because that is a probable possibility. Yeah, that, that's what it was. You, you screamed this point at me, so I had to bring it up on the call. <laughs> um, but the 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 big thing, and um, I know there's actually a few people on this call who've kind of raised this with us as a business about a challenge for them. So um, I hadn't identified that actually, from a marketing analytics perspective, we are getting into a world where there's less data, not more. And because I really don't know, like, I, I've not really been able to think about it in any way i'm just going to kind of hand the floor back to you norman and say you're obviously passionate about this like what what is it why is it happening and more importantly how can you still be effective in this world as analysts yeah um, i mean i have to be passionate about it otherwise i'd be in the wrong profession um, <laughs> but in in terms of so you know a lot of stuff has happened this year this year for the industry so if you you know there's been a lot of stuff on the news where the IDFA and Apple stuff has happened. And that just puts, and then, you know, a couple of years ago, GDPR came into play. And there's this whole idea of consent, which is, you know, arguably the right way to go. And you want to protect your consumers and you want to give them the option that actually, do you want to be contacted by us? But what that's that does, arguable. sorry? That's not arguable. Oh no, it's not <laughs> arguable. I'm saying arguably it's the wrong, oh God, now you've got me tongue tied. <laughs> The he always does this to me no he's right it's not arguable you you need to give people the option to be in charge of how their information is processed and why it's processed at any way um it's only fair it's their information it's not ours but what that what that does is that it changes the game slightly is that you can't follow them around in every way they can't walk past a location and you suddenly send them a hey here's an ad and because you know they don't allow you to um, and that gets into a really interesting world because it almost goes back to basics where things like above the line marketing become more important. You drive your brand better. You drive your engagement with your customers better. And, you know, it's not as targeted. Um, 
you have, con you know, your display marketing becomes more important where you are doing uh, contextual marketing where you're using the sites that might be interest of your customers and, you know, serving ads there. That way you don't have to follow people, you're respecting their privacy, but you're also getting your brand message out there. So, you know, I think that's the way the world's changing. At some point, it, that, that change is going to accelerate. But I think people, a lot of marketers are already aware of this and are, you know, engaging with their current client base. The loyalty programs are a big, big thing. I am obsessed with beauty products. I think my partner the other day said that you buy something new every week and then you use it for a week and then it gets thrown away. But the reason I do that is because they do their marketing so well. You know, they, they hit me with the right message at the right time because they've taken the time to get my consent, understand what I am, understand where I am in their funnel. And then they hit me with a message and I'm all over it, over on Instagram stories, engage with their surveys. And that's the way it's moving, you know. I'm, I hope I answered that I'm, question. I got I'm really carried away in my excitement. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one having that exact conversation. That's that makes me feel a lot better about my life. Um, so okay, yeah, that, that's that's um, that that makes a lot of sense. And it was it was I it was kind of eye opening to me when we had that first conversation to, to think of the world as a as a less as a place with less data rather than more. But specifically since like GDPR and stuff, you're absolutely right. It's it's um, it's come in. So um, this is the 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 toughest part of the uh, of the of the call because you. This is the bit where I just say, so guys, any pearls of wisdom that the guys can walk away with from listening before we dive into other questions? So yeah, any anybody like who wants to go first? What what would you say are the most important thing that analysts and businesses should be thinking about with marketing and pricing data going into 2021? Go on, James, you're really good at advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think uh, from my perspective, uh, it's really all about, you know, staying super simple. You know, what are the actual priorities of the business? What are we trying to do? Let's line up resources behind that. And that's not just, you know, from the analytics side, but, you know, across the, all the different teams. Uh, let's figure out the, what are the, you know, the big things that we want to work on, and then let's, you know, tackle them in a super data-driven manner, which means let's figure out upfront what are the objectives, what are the KPIs that are going to drive those. Let's track them. Let's track them daily if we can, or even, you know, intraday if we need to. Um, and let's use the data that we have in order to have the biggest impact on the business. Um, but for me, it's like, it's very important to be super simple. So, you know, measure what it is that you want to do, um, be clear, make sure that those definitions are easy for people to understand, not complicated aggregated metrics or anything like that. Uh, make sure you prioritize the things that are going to be most impactful for the business. Uh, and then make sure that everybody agrees that those are the priorities. Okay, cool. And then you enter the cycle. <laughs> Insight, recommendation, output. I think, you know, I think there's one thing I would add to that. And it's the only thing is, and I learned this the hard way, is when people say to you, I need this information. As, as the one piece of advice that I give myself and I give other people is, don't just give them that information. Often the easiest solution is to say, what do you want to do with it? And I think eight times out of 10, I found the thing that they were asking for is not the thing they needed. And the answer already existed. They just didn't know where to look for it. So as soon as you start asking, what do you need it for? I think you save yourself a lot of time. Um, and that's irrespective of whether you're in analytics, whether, you know, whatever you're doing, asking, what do you want to do with it? Usually also one builds a better relationship and two saves you time. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I, I, I was <laughs> not, nodding probably a bit too enthusiastic with that, but yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> The why question is a really, really important one in, in analytics. And very often the response will be, oh, I just think it'd be interesting to look at. That's <laughs> yeah. not good enough. This stuff isn't free. Your time isn't free as analysts. And you, you've, you've got to take a scientific approach to this. I've talked about this on previous, uh, previous webinars. Um, but <clears throat> I think really it's about that hypothesis and it's about testing that hypothesis. That's what it's got to come down to, and I, I love that. Now, and just the, the ask the question. Don't 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 be uh, don't be sort of uh, a, a blocker, but go on that that discovery with the the stakeholder because that mm. conversation can lead to exactly as you said. Oh well, actually, we've already got that in a report over here. Let me help you navigate 
our reporting infrastructure. Um, or, okay, actually that is quite interesting because somebody else over here has asked this question, let's let's think about what the hypothesis is around that space, build the test. And then James completely, that build, measure, learn um, framework is and, and it, it just the sort of cyclic um, route road forward along that, uh, 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 with that framework in mind is absolutely the way to do it. It's constantly iterative. It's constantly have a thought, build the test, measure it, apply the uh, apply the outcome, apply the insight. So yeah, uh, really, really love that. Uh, I think the, the one thing I'd add is just automate the repeatable is just the most important thing. As, as data professionals, you just spend so much time there's that there's that stat right eight percent of the data professional time is spent munging or crunching or manipulating or whatever the word is um the, the data and only 20 percent is actually uh spent extracting the value so the more you can do it once and do it well and automate that thing have that have a computer run that thing for you the uh, the, the better your time is valuable all right, so we've, we've got three great questions in already. Um, like I said, if people now they've heard the lot, they want to start asking questions, then put them in the Q&A. They're not a public question. I'll, I'll read them out. And if you want them to stay anonymous, I'll keep them anonymous. Um, but the, fir the first question um, we'll go with is one from James, who I know everybody in the, uh, in the, in the group knows. So that's quite a nice, a nice place to start. So um, I'm working on introducing a more data-driven culture rather than a subjective judgment-led culture. The problem is that the business has been very successful despite its absence of data and dependence on subjectivity. What are your learnings on how to best introduce a data-driven culture? Um, over to other James, I guess, first. <laughs> you mean Nerman number two? <laughs> no, Nerman two, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think with these kinds of things, uh, it's always best just to start small. Find yourself a nice hero use case, which is nice and clean and clear, and you know what you're going to get, uh, and then start tackling that. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm thinking of an example, but I'm not sure to share any examples. But uh, but basically, like you know, if you choose something small and narrow and defined, and that you know you're going to need to do, and then just do that really, really well. And then once that's done, you find the next one, and you keep kind of going from there. Um, I think that's that's uh, that's something we talk about a lot in terms of work out which use case is most important, solve it, fix it, make it easy, and then work out what the next most important is. So, yeah, Matt, any thoughts on on that side of things? Yeah, I completely agree. Prove by doing, definitely uh, get that toehold. Um, uh, as I say, James, this this is exactly the situation I had at uh, at Just Eat. Um, so I had the free. Uh, a free implementation of Google Analytics uh, with heavily sampled data at that point, because they're already massive. Um, I had um, uh, occasional access to the production uh, database sitting behind the website. So I had, but I wasn't allowed to write queries directly against that. So I had to write queries against one of seven QA environments and then send that query over to the DevOps team for them to run it against production. And then they'd inevitably come back and say, the query didn't run. Well, yeah, I'm writing against the QA environment that's not the same. So can you tell, no, I've already closed the window, sorry. Awesome. So I had to, <laughs> I had to really translate the kind of pain that I was feeling directly in my analyst role, um, that they'd obviously made an investment uh, in me as an analyst. Uh, I had to translate the pain that I was feeling into uh, something bigger to communicate, well, you know, there is value in doing this well. Um, look to look to other examples um, of, of, sort of similar businesses, my previous experience, speak to the kind of opportunity that, that potentially lies there. And then exactly as James says, find that toehold, find that thing that is going to resonate with those stakeholders and build the bridges in that way. Um, so I think it, it gets quite specific depending on business, but uh, you, people get very excited pretty quickly. Um, with the the art of the possible, um, with this stuff and the the the, the data driven culture uh, can follow quite closely behind. I think I would add. Sorry, I'm rambling on, but I would add that um, people are often very kind of proud of their of the success of their gut feel answers to questions. I knew it was going to be that, and it was that, and I'm right, and you know that's that's uh, sort of testament to the value that I bring to the business, and it's absolutely a thing. I think you've got to be very careful not to sort of undermine that. Um, uh, data should um, support 
uh, support those things and, and uh, measure and um, uh, evaluate those hypotheses, I think is, is the really critical thing. Uh, so it comes back to that build, measure, learn uh, ethos. Okay, cool. Um, ben has just asked a fantastic question, I think, um, Nerman, for you, um, as a great place to start. Um, as a manager of a team of analysts or scientists, how much of your time do you spend still doing analytics versus managing the team? And how does that change as team size grows and, and expands out? Hey, Ben. Um, <laughs> I, I think it depends on the day you ask me. There are times when, so recently I did this like training course that Wild Remote put me on to be a, a better leader. And, you know, there was a framework that was introduced that James keeps quoting to me and I keep quoting back to him, which is the method of delegation. And it's saying, you know, if it's super important and super urgent, you kind of just have to go and do it yourself because it will probably take you longer to tell somebody what it needs to be. And then the next stages of delegation are about, you know, is it going to be a growth opportunity for your team member? Because at the end of the day, we're all in the job to grow. If we're not growing, then, you know, we're not going to be engaged. We're not going to want to do that. So then it's that. Uh, and then it's the whole case of who can also do it quicker. If it's important but not urgent, who's got the skill set? So in, to, in the sense of answering the question is that majority of the time, the most important thing is to manage your team, make sure their challenges are unblocked, make sure that you know they're delivering the things that need to deliver, you're supporting them. If that means you need to support them by doing analytics or support them by just talking to them and, you know, have taken a walk with them over Zoom and just swearing at each other or whatever it is that you need to do. I think the key thing is that you put management above doing analytics and obviously do the work where you need to do. As team changes, obviously you're going to end up doing more management. You're going to go to meetings. You're going to be the strategic driver. Um, the only thing you can hope for is that you stay organized. Um, looking at you, James. Um, <laughs> and you make sure, you know, you just have an idea of the wins you need to have and you communicate those clearly across the business. And we do that. Um, and I think that's where it supports the team the best, which is to say, these are your priorities. I'm going to communicate your priorities, which means if everybody knows what you're doing, they won't disturb you with all of the little things. They do anyway, but that's part and pass, parcel of being an analyst. I hope that answers your question. No, I think absolutely fantastic answer. And I think what it, what it comes back to is... Um, like just a more general rule for business, right? Like I'm just listening to the hard things about hard things by Ben Horowitz, who's obviously um, massively in a, in the kind of startup scale up space. And um, the recurring message within that book is people first. And I think that's the management style you've just described. We go, pe we, we go managing the team first because actually if the people are effective and the people are happy and producing, then everything else will, will flow as a, as a kind of higher higher efficiency result off the back of it. So yeah, absolutely. And, and hope, I'm sure that was helpful for them um, as, as they're going on that, the start of that journey. Um, I definitely yeah. just, I'd, I'd just add, oh, no, I no. think it's definitely worth trying to keep your eye in as much as you possibly can. I've definitely had points in my career where I have been too far removed from the yeah. uh, analytics and the, and the actual application of skills and it's easy to fall behind, right? And I think that, puts you in a pretty, un can put you in a pretty uncomfortable position. Uh, and, and I think that uncomfortable position could be, you start to potentially lack empathy, you forget what it was like, you forget um, the, the, the approach that needs to be taken and some of the, the you know, difficulties of, of uh, delivering the analytics. Um, so I think the more you can do to stay close to it um, without being without being an overbearing micromanager, um, the, the better is striking that balance as ever. I feel strongly that if somebody has time to micromanage, then they don't have enough work. <laughs> <laughs> but I completely agree. I mean, half the fun of the job, right, is actually getting to, to play with the data by yourself. Um, I do feel a bit sad that, you know, the majority of my work these days is like, you know, select star limit 100, but you know, group by one, two, and that's about it. Um, but I think, you know, staying close to it is important because if you don't understand the underlying data sets, particularly whatever company you work at, it's very hard for you to coach and manage and manage expectations, but also help people develop and that kind of thing. Absolutely. So on that theme, um, the questions that have come in from Renuka are probably a little bit more 
like narrow towards analysis specifically, James. So we'll uh, we'll test your thesis there, um, James. How does how does World Remit feed the analytics insights to drive revenue on the website? Do you build features out of the analytics insights, specifically in relation to the website and um, that type of um, analysis? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a little bit like, uh, in some ways it would be hard to tell where it actually initiates, right? Because the product managers and the product analysts would work super, super close together, which means that, you know, that ideation component of it is going to be, you know, hand in hand, if that makes sense. Whether or not it's evaluating a previous experiment to understand what happens, which means that you then get a recommendation off the back of that, or it's trying to understand current user behavior to understand, you know, how we can build something better or, uh, you know, introduce a new feature or, or anything like that, you know, rearrange the flow. Um, actually, one of the things that we're in the process of rolling out right now, and actually you can see it on our, our site, is that we have just completely redesigned the, the website. Um, and so we're in the process of rolling that out. It's an open beta right now, so you have the ability to swap back and forth. But all of that uh, ideation and development obviously comes from a data-driven data approach. Um, and so, you know, if I think about and that's where I think a little bit of the difference between how I approach analytics versus data science. Um, I know there's a lot of competition in terms of the, the terms, uh, but obviously both are within our team. Um, I think for me, it's, it's not so much about the title. It's about, you know, how it is that their work is used. So for, you know, the analytics side of the team, where it's very much about strategy, recommendation, insights, that's about, you know, the overall stream decisions that we make versus the data science team, you know, might be powering features which uh, are going to make a much more granular decision, uh, you know, like a, on a user basis or anything like that that might, might be a little bit different. Okay, awesome. So conscious of time, we've got about a minute left, but I'll just ask this last question just because it should be fairly short and sharp, but... Um, who modules the promotion strategy? Is it the digital marketing team or an analytics team? Nerman? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, it, it's a bit of both, right? At the end of the day, we do work in terms of like a strategic function of, you know, where we've done this, this has happened, where we've done that, that's happened. Um, I guess it's twofold. <laughs> is that there is, if we're looking at acquisition, those promot promotional strategies are very different to when you're looking at retention. So it's one separating those two things out. And the most important thing is, what did we learn in the past? You know, we look at that, we say, this is what we learned, this is what worked well, this is what didn't. But ultimately, you know, you, you forward that on at some point and say, these are our recommendations, and then the marketing team will themselves make the decisions they need to make based on the information we've provided them. So it's, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's not that we're saying, do this, do this, do this. It's just that we've noticed this, what do you think? And you have that open-ended conversation and you come to a solution together. Nice, okay. At least that's what I think happens in my head. Whereas, you know, tomorrow I might get a message saying, uh, no, man. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've totally misread this world you live in, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, cool. So obviously, um, Guys, uh, we're so grateful for you taking the time out to join us and kind of share your share your wisdom, share your experience. And um, it's been really enjoyable to have you on. Um, for anybody listening, um, if anyone wants to learn more about Clean's tool, then that's my job. I'll be happy to help you understand how Clean helps analysts be more effective and help speed up that, um, that speed to insight. So love to do that too. You can email me at greg at clean.ai. That's greg, G-R-E-G, -E at clean.ai. Um, otherwise, we'll share the recording just in case you want to share it with anybody else in your team. Uh, back end of January, we'll be having an, another webinar. I think the theme is probably going to be on selling um, selling analytics into the business and and more kind of like more even more practical steps on how to do that and possibly even build out a business plan for analytics and growing analytics within the business really nice topic going into the new year when a lot of people will be thinking about it so 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 grateful to you guys for joining us and um everybody for for tuning in so thank you very much and uh we'll call it a day there thank you, thank you very much Bye.